This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The second round of the NBA playoffs is underway. We got a full slate with four games across the next two nights in the NBA. Here to break down all those games is Austin Sway. We're going to pick Austin's brain about his favorite bets across all four games of FanDuel Sports, but can get his general vibe and where he thinks those series are going. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here by Austin Swain. You can find him on Twitter at aswain3. Find his work over at FanDuel Research. Austin, happy Monday to you. How you doing? I'm doing great. And more importantly, I know how you're doing because it's no secret to your audience. You're a motorsports guy. You had Max Verstappen upset yesterday yep. in F1. And yep. then the closest finish in NASCAR history. It really doesn't get much better of a Sunday uh, from an intrigue perspective for Jim Sonis. So we're, it, we're riding high into Monday. It was pretty good. Uh, I had Lando to podium. I tried to add him live to win, but as, as always happens, the odds shortened as you're like pre- after you press submit. So decided against adding there. But hey, you know, still got the podium. Got Esteban Ocon top ten. That was ten nice. to one. So good week there. Uh, NASCAR didn't go as well from a betting perspective, but like it, it's it's okay when it's a finish like that. I'm willing to accept a couple of losses. And like I know that like we're here. Like I want to make money, but like. My entertainment's worth the value, too. And I think that's my perspective on it, at least. Yeah, definitely it is. Let's not talk about my UFC card, though. Ebbs and flows of sports betting. Worst UFC card of the year. We're moving on to St. Louis. and we'll figure I was going to ask you if you had a fun time. So were you still able to enjoy it oh, despite yeah. that or no? Okay. Oh, yeah. Great title fight. Uh, I mean, the crowd in Brazil was awesome. Jose Aldo is a legend. So um, all of those things were positive. And like you said, from an entertainment perspective, I definitely got my money's worth. Okay, well, that is what we're here for, for sure. Now, for today, we're going to talk to Austin about these NBA playoff games. Got to get his, his thoughts on, I can I can I say my Timberwolves again? Like, is that fair? We'll talk about that. Uh, can I reclaim them despite ignoring them for the first 32 years of my life? We'll, we'll litigate that uh, later on. Talk about all four games across Monday and Tuesday at FanDuel Sportsbook. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We are here Monday through Friday, breaking down uh, whatever it may be from a betting perspective, letting you know where you can find value over at FanDuel Sportsbook across various sports. To find that, go search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts hit subscribe and if you like what you hear leave us a five star rating as well and of course the show is on FanDuel TV plus and the FanDuel YouTube page as well the NBA playoffs are tipped off but it's not too late to get in on the action with FanDuel because right now new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning five dollar bet that's 150 dollars used on same game parlays live bets championship futures and so much more there's no better place to bet all the playoff action than america's number one sports book fanduel official sports betting partner of the nba must be 21 plus and president select states first online real money wager only ten dollar first deposit required bonus issued is non withdrawable bonus bets which expire seven days after receipt not available in north carolina Carolina. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, D.C., Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Vermont, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777. Or over the ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9 with it in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700. Visit chaosgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland, 1-800-gambler.net in West Virginia, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org. Or call you under 327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Or call 1-877-A-HOPE-N-Y or text HOPE-N-Y in New York. Let's start things off with Monday night's games, beginning with the Pacers and the Knicks. Right now at FanDuel Sportsbook, the Knicks are favored by 5.5 for game number one. Total at 217.5. And, and obviously... The Knicks, the favorites to win the series, are minus 265 at FanDuel Sportsbook, but the Pacers, big win against the Bucks in the opening round. So what's your read on game one here, Austin? 
Yeah, I, it's an interesting series where we don't really have a long established um, a view of either of these teams, particularly where, the, you know, the Knicks, they got knocked out in the second round by the Heat last year. Pacers, of course, the baby Pacers making it up as they go. Uh, I like one I like one sort of traditional market here and one prop. And we'll start with the traditional market. I like the Indiana Pacers team total over one oh five and a half. It's minus 115 on FanDuel right now. And it's a little squeamish to take overs in this series when the expected base based on what we saw last round 92.0 it is slow these teams play slow as you kind of expect it, these two teams had old slow rivalries a long long time ago and it's kind of that again but new york's defense to me is an angle that i want to target they just haven't quite lived up to the billing of what they were in the regular season they had a 116.9 defensive rating in the first round um and that was fourth worst of all teams in the playoffs and certainly worst of the teams that moved on in the regular season indiana was second in offensive rating over 120 Philadelphia was way back in 19th, and I know Embiid was injured and some of that stuff, but I definitely see this as a step up in competition for the Knicks defense that didn't really ace the first round. And um, the Pacers averaged 113 points a game in the first round. That was with a ton of variance against a faster opponent in Milwaukee. But my model has them at about a projected 108.7 points tonight. Um, you look at some other ones, Number Fire has this at 111.3 for their team total as well. I think there is decent value, and to me it all comes back to the genesis that the Knicks defense isn't quite what it is now. Now, Indiana's defense struggled in the regular season. That's why I'm avoiding uh, game total. That's why I'm avoiding the spread here. I do like the Pacers angle here um, at 106 and a half when I, I'm a little wary about the Knicks scoring because they're just playing such heavy minutes. I wonder when the legs are going to give out. Yeah, so that team total, as you mentioned, for the Pacers, 105 and a half over is minus 115. You've got this closer to 108. So bit of value there buying into this Pacers team, which has been a fun one to follow the entire year. Now, you mentioned baby Pacers figuring out as they go. It seems like that has not hampered them on the offensive side of things. It's been more so just a defense, but that's not impacted in this market here at all. Yeah, exactly. And you look at their pieces together. There are a lot of different ways that it makes sense that they have playoff success. Of course, Pascal Siakam had his run with the Raptors. Miles Turner, a great rim protector around the rim, can step out and hit threes. And then Tyrese Halliburton is just a very smart, high IQ floor general. So like, I don't particularly look at them as an offense and say won't translate to the playoffs. I, I think that they have the ability to score in those tight half court situations. Okay, so Austin is on the over team total, 105 and a half minus 115. He said there's a prop here as well. Which prop is that for you in this game? Yeah, so I'm flipping over to the other side when I'm going to talk about Indiana's defense. I am showing value on this game over. I just chose to attack it this way, uh, given the Knicks minutes. But um, I like OG Ananobi for the Knicks over 22 and a half points and rebounds if you head to the player combos tab on FanDuel Sportsbook. The Knicks kind of moved away from Dante DiVincenzo and advanced out of the first round, which would have been shocking to me before the playoffs because DiVincenzo had been such an incredible um, force for them offensively. The reason why they survived is because of OG Ananobi. At least 16 points and six rebounds in 45 plus minutes in the last three games of the series in regulation. He actually had a 50 minute game in there when you include overtime, but he's playing heavy, heavy minutes. He's barely resting just like Josh Hart isn't at, at all. And it should be a great series on the wing for him. When you look at Indiana positionally, they have Aaron Neesmith there. They don't probably don't feel great about him compared to other starters. Second most points, seventh most rebounds allowed to small forwards this season. Indiana doesn't bring that same defensive level intensity. That's why the Bucs got him a couple of times in the first round. Uh, FanDuel Research uh, are super cool new NBA projections that you should check out. FanDuel.com slash research slash NBA. Uh, they've got him projected for 21.6 points, 5.9 rebounds, which clears this prop by quite a bit. And he sticks out at his DFS salary as well. So I like OG Ananobi in a game that I'm expecting to be competitive. Indiana to score points. Decent environment. It all seems like it spells well for OG. So basically what you're doing here via the team total and the prop is you're getting two separate exposures to the over without actually betting the over itself. You know, you right. like that angle, but you're finding other ways to attack it to give yourself more security in case things go awry. Right, exactly. And, and you know, some other factors here. Jalen Brunson dropping 40 a game in the first round. When will that particularly not happen? And then all of a sudden, I didn't want exposure in the next spread, even though I expect them sure. to have offensive success. It's You have to weigh your markets carefully, and I think right. this is the best angles, angles, plural, I wanted to take for a pretty good offensive environment by playoff standard. All right, so Pacers, Knicks, Austin has Pacers team total over one, 105 and a half, minus 115, and OG and Anobi over 22 and a half points plus rebounds. That is minus 111 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's talk about 
my favorite game on this four four game slate between the two nights. That is the Wolves and the Nuggets right now. FanDuel Sportsbook Nuggets are favored by five and a half. Total is two oh eight. And my Wolves began thing with a bang, began things with a bang in game number one, getting the win there. How do you see things playing out in game number two, Austin? Yeah, I'm not sure uh, over on the East Coast that you love that 10 p.m. Eastern tip time uh, for Minnesota. Denver. I get an I hour of reprieve here in Illinois, which does oh, help, good. but it's still nine o'clock and my bedtime is like 10. So it's it's not ideal is what I would yeah. say. You'll you'll have to get the first half. Maybe I'll, I'll cook you up a first half wager off the show. Right. But uh, <laughs> Timber, I, but Timberwolves taking on the Nuggets, like you said, big upset here. I'm going to take the Timberwolves plus five and a half minus 108. If they're going to continue to give me the better team with points, I'll continue to take them because by all measures in the regular season at worst the six seed suns were better than the eighth seed lakers so i'm kind of comparing apples to apples if not minnesota maybe had a little bit harder of a test in round one even including saturday plus 12.7 net rating to just plus 1.9 for denver and if you look at some of the metrics from the game on saturday game one of like what i would expect from regression well the nuggets shot better from three-point land they had a better turnover rate minnesota just did what they do which is control the offensive glass got better interior looks and the reality is jamal murray's just simply not healthy for the nuggets right now you can see it on the court and you can see it in his production if he's not giving them 30 plus a game without decent efficiency they're not an incredibly deep team it's tough for them to win they needed two buzzer beaters in round one just to get by the lakers minnesota is a much better team especially defensively even if Denver nods this series, they've got a great home court advantage. Obviously, the championship pedigree. I love getting more than a basket here, plus five and a half in another pretty tight game. Yeah, right now, FanDuel Sportsbook, the Wolves, plus five and a half is minus 108. You mentioned that you think the Wolves are the better team overall. Is there a concern the Nuggets turn things on in the postseason, given that they're kind of of that championship mentality where it's like, okay, we can kind of coast during the regular season, turn mm -hmm. things up in the playoffs. Is there a concern that they do that or have those concerns been nullified by, by what you've seen both in game one and mm -hmm. in their first round playoff series? Yeah, I just don't, I, you know, I, you, you certainly want to give credence to that because once you've been there, done that before we see it in the NBA, we saw a couple years years ago with the Warriors. So it's on my mind, but the sample continues to get larger. Minnesota, Oklahoma City, and Boston all had a vastly superior net rating to Denver in the regular season, and they've been crushing teams all above a 10 net rating in the playoffs. Denver still hasn't picked up the gas. They haven't got on the gas, and it's just making me start to think that losing Bruce Brown in the offseason, Jamal Murray not being 100%, there's a little bit of steam out of this Nuggets team, which I I get accused of being a hater all the time, but they did have the easiest strength of schedule by win percentage in the NBA for a championship since 1970. So they went through the eight seed heat. You know, the, it wasn't these titanic matchups last year. I think they're much more normal and human compared to these other te great teams than maybe the market is giving them credit for. Okay, so like in Wolves, plus five and a half here, minus one away. Anything else for you in this game, Austin? Uh, no, I didn't quite see anything on a player prop perspective. We had some market adjustment corrections after game one, maybe some role changes. Uh, your guy, Naz Reed, maybe he'll not spit out 14 points in the fourth quarter again, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that one plays out for your Timberwolves. I hope he does. We'll just we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that there. Okay, so let's move on to Tuesday's games where we've got the Cavs and the Celtics to lead things off. Game number one here, Celtics favored by 11. Total is 209, or actually down to now or up to 209 and a half. Celtics minus 1600 to win the series, Austin. And, you know, that's affecting the market here for game one. So can the Cavs keep it close enough to cover here and any bets you like in this game? Yeah, the Boston Celtics, they test my comfort as a better. I don't like laying huge numbers, especially the in the NBA. Three-point variance can be a th big thing, but they had double-digit numbers their entire first-round series. Here they are 11 again against a good, a good Cavs team. They came through against the Magic and had a really nice year in the Eastern Conference. I'm still taking, I, I'm choosing to attack this via Boston Celtics first half spread. It's minus seven and a half, but coming back at plus 112, you know, a physical game seven on Sunday between the Cavs and the Magic while Boston has been resting. They still don't know if they're going to get Jared Allen, the Cavaliers. And then Boston was outstanding in round one, plus 17.2 net rating, but they also lost a game in there. A weird three point game from Miami shot 54% from three. Other than that, Boston completely dominated the series. I know they didn't have Jimmy Butler, but Caval Cleveland Cavaliers, 
not really coming in on great form. Negative 4.9 net rating in their series. They really, really struggled in Orlando. They had a negative 24.9 net rating in Orlando. That is a trend that is now continued from their playoff run last year where they had a negative 15.2 net rating on the road. So I don't think they travel well. They're on a rest disadvantage. Boston is looking like a wrecking machine here. The full game spread is so large that theoretically Boston could be up 20 with six minutes left. They wave the white flag, and then all of a sudden I'm in variance with guys at the end of the bench and, and wondering if they're going to hang on. That's why I prefer the first half spread angle here. I think the Celtics comfortably control this. Not super worried about the Kristaps Porzingis injury from that. Didn't have him in either of their last two games. Entered the fourth quarter up at least 22 points in both. I just think they're the best team in the NBA. I'd be really surprised if they didn't come out of the East, which is reflective in their series price and their Eastern Conference price over minus 200. So um, I, I'm going to keep backing the wrecking ball here. Uh, that is with the Celtics first half spread minus seven and a half plus 112. Now in that heat series, we saw the heat kind of take this high variance approach where mm -hmm. they shot a lot of threes and it did get them a win. But like it's a it's a hard thing to sustain. You are mm -hmm. leaning into the variance and accepting the fact you're the lesser team. Yep. Are the Cavs similar where they can kind of go with that approach or is that not as much their game where they can't necessarily benefit from variance in that way? So the Cavaliers had the third worst true shooting percentage in the first round. They're not really a great shooting team anyway. Now they do have individual great shooters like a Donovan Mitchell, who's now had two straight efforts over 35 points, like a Darius Garland who can help in that respect. But a lot of the other pieces, they don't have the three point talent that maybe a Miami did. When you think about Jaime Yaquez, Duncan Robinson, Tyler hero guys that can really hit triples. Cleveland has not been that type of team all year, which I think is even worse um, from that perspective, but Cleveland's defensively is a lot better than that crew was without Jimmy Butler. So I'm expecting these games to be more low scoring, uh, four of the five Celtics games in the first round went over their projected point total. Maybe these ones are a bit mo a bit more low scoring and it creates like a tighter spread in general. I could very easily see myself on Cavs spread, especially as this, this series shifts, shifts to Cleveland. Um, but it's not their game to kind of lean in, go 55% yeah. from three and steal one here. And we were talking with Ed last week, Ed Fang, about like how as the series goes along, you get tend to get lower totals as teams mm -hmm. understand their the opposing sets and stuff like that. Lower totals correlates with tighter spreads. So mm -hmm. maybe down the line we get there, but yep. not for the first half of game one. So Austin taking the Celtics minus seven and a half plus 112. Other game on Tuesday is the Mavs and the Thunder. Right now, FanDuel Sportsbook. Thunder favored by three and a half of this one at home. Total is 217. Thunder well rested here after they, after they swept New Orleans. Anything stand out to you in game one? Yes, this should be a great series. Um, I, I think we're all in consensus about that. It's probably the best second round series in terms of competitiveness, although the other one out West gives it a run for its money. But I have to favor the Thunder here in game one. Like you said, they are coming off substantial rest. And we are all kind of wondering, Chet Holmgren in his second year, uh, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, Jalen Williams, these pieces, they don't have a lot of NBA experience. Were they going to fall apart in the playoffs? I was stunned they blew through the Pelicans in such fat dominant fashion when game one is a two-point game. I expected sh series shifts to New Orleans. Maybe it stays tighter. These guys kept doing their thing. Um, they, when you look at how the Mavericks, on the other hand, played the Clippers, I know the Clippers were a better team in the regular season than the Pelicans, but the Clippers also missing their best player, Kawhi Leonard. When you look how these two teams performed, performed plus 16.2 net rating for Oklahoma City, plus 6.3 for Dallas. And Dallas honestly comes in now. It's kind of a kind of a concerning injury for them. Maxi Kleba defensive big has allowed them to stretch the floor. They now don't have that particular option. They're going to have to go to one of their two centers. Um, I think OKC is the better team here. Um, I, I think that they are an incredible home team, 27 and 14 against the spread this season, 12 plus 12.8 net rating. They only got two home games in the first round, split the spread one, one. So the sample's not very large, but I think it's a great home court advantage, huge rest, a huge rest angle. It's a little bit of what we talked about with Boston where Maybe it's a bit of a buzzsaw in this first game, and then Luka and Kyrie can get their feet under them. Maybe this series ships back to Dallas and the young guys start to feel the pressure. But I'm going to take a very small number at minus three and a half to begin the series here. That minus three and a half on the Thunder in this one is currently at minus 110. I didn't mean to bring up the Mavs. I kind of forgot about the Clippers angle for you. So sorry about forcing you to discuss them. Here in the second round, uh, as you, the Clippers fan, my apologies on that. But either way, uh, taking the Thunder minus three and a half here. Again, minus 110. Any props stand out to you in this one, Austin? 
Yeah, so I am nervously going to Luka Doncic for a prop, and it's maybe not the prop you're expecting. I'm going with Luka Doncic under 42 and a half points and assists, which is a really sweaty prop to take anytime you're going against a great player who can drop 30 on any given night. But Shea Gilgis Alexander's defense, one of the huge reason I was among a few people that thought the MVP race should have been a bit closer than it was. SGA great on both ends of the floor, and you see that in Oklahoma City's positional stats. Third fewest points, 10th fewest assists allowed to opposing point guards this year. The reason I'm avoiding rebounds on this combo prop and, and not just doing the full combo is because number one, Oklahoma City's pretty neutral matchup for rebounds to point guards. And number two, that I think the Kleba injury will actually help Luca's volume on the glass. So those notes aside, if I just look at the points and assists, I think it correlates well to the idea that I like a Thunder win by a few points where Luka Doncic doesn't go berserk and end up stealing game one. It kind of, in theory, fits together. FanDuel Research, again, our projections have Luka Doncic at 39.6 total points and assists, 29.5 points, 10.1 assists. A huge part of why I feel comfortable taking this angle here in game one is I don't think that they grind Luka for 45 minutes trying to steal home court advantage that isn't particularly there. They know they're on a rest disadvantage. It's not like game seven yesterday yesterday where Donovan Mitchell barely came off the floor. They know that they're in a, in a pretty precarious position. Um, but on Monday here, this is a line that I'm waiting for because it actually increased from last night. And frankly, you know, betters want to bet stars to do star type of things in the NBA playoffs. I totally get it. So if I'm showing value on the other side, this is a hold for me right this second. But then as soon as I see the number stabilize or even unfortunately go back the other direction is when I'll go ahead and take a peek at Doncic under points and assists when the line kind of balances out. Okay, so it's at 42 and a half right now. Would you consider <laughs> pairing these together? Because I think all customers have a 30% parlay profit or same game parlay profit boost over at FanDuel Sportsbook for, I believe, every day of the NBA playoffs. <laughs> uh, more details on that over at FanDuel Sportsbook. But they do correlate, as you alluded to. They play well together. And that's kind of what you want for a same game parlay is you want yep. them to play well together. You don't want to kneecap yourself if one of those bets does cash. Doncic under 42 and a half with the Thunder minus three and a half or 42 and a half points plus assists with the Thunder minus three and a half plus 185 of FanDuel Sportsbook. Is that a fair price in your eyes considering they do work well together or no? Well, uh, yeah. Well, especially if you get the profit boost, which helps take right. out some of the concerns of any of the hold that might come w with a parlay. Like I, because I think FanDuel that, does know they're correlated. You're right. Yep. Yeah, because FanDuel knows they're correlated. You know, so like from a math perspective, I'm not a I'm not an extremely voluminous parlay better. I I try not to when I can. But if you get a profit boost, these are the type of props you want to take. Ones that correlate well together, and then the profit boost can help you overcome a lot of that stuff. And I'm straight betting both of these myself, so I absolutely would recommend value on both okay so what we're seeing here across the tuesday games is luka Doncic under 42 and a half re or points plus assists again keep tabs in the market to see as it shifts as thing go things go along uh it's minus 120 right now thunder minus three and a half minus 110 and then the celtics minus seven and a half in the first half plus 112 in their game with uh, the Cavs on Tuesday night. That's all we got for Austin for today. Austin Swain, you can find him on Twitter at aswain 3 Check out his work over at the alluded to FanDuel Research. Austin, appreciate the time as always. Good luck to you. Enjoy the NBA NHL playoffs. We'll talk to you again, hopefully in the very near future. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. Alrighty, again, find Austin on Twitter at Ace23. You can find his UFC podcast every Friday uh, when they have cards on the FanDuel Research podcast feed as well. Before we close up for today, got to recap recommendations from last week here on the show. And let's begin things with the big banger that was the Kentucky Derby. Fantastic finish there in the Derby as well. Our two experts to preview the Derby were Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV and Dubs Anderson of FanDuel TV as well. Find Christina on Twitter at Christina FDTV and find Dubs on Twitter at Mr. Dubsy. Christina's pick was just a touch as the no sweat bet for the Derby. Just a touch was 10 to one on the morning line and dubs like stronghold to win the Derby at 20 to one. So go with the longer shot of uh, mystic Dan, the winner here by a nose over Sierra Leone, a fantastic finish there. Neither one got that, but they both got the Kentucky Oaks pick that was on Friday. Both Dubs and Christina discussed Thorpedo Anna as the winner on Friday. Thorpedo Anna was 5-1 to one on the morning line, got down, I think, to 7-2 to two at one point, but then back uh, closed it around 4-1, to one, and Thorpedo Anna won the Oaks in dominant fashion. So great call by both Christina and Dubs. 
uh, re- appreciate them swinging by the show here. We'll get some more uh, Triple Crown thoughts later on this month as we talk more about that, uh, of course, here on the show. We'll hopefully get one of them back here on the show to preview that as well. But find, find Christina on Twitter at ChristinaFDTV and check out Dubs on Twitter at Mr. Dubsy. We have the final the uh, final tally from we had Tom Vecchio on to preview the first round of the NBA and NHL playoffs. Find Tom on Twitter at Tom underscore Vecchio one. The first one that we had not yet discussed was the Mavs minus 134 to win the series over the Clippers. That one did cash Kawhi Leonard banged up or out the entire series. That was part of the thought process for Tom there. The Mavs did win the series at minus 134. Tom had the Cavs minus one and a half games at plus 104 taking on the Magic. That one went seven games. The Cavs did win, but did not win it uh, on the spread at minus one and a half games. So uh, no win there. Tom did hit the Bruins and the Maple Leafs. He liked that to go either six or seven games. It was plus 194 to go six games, longer than that to go seven games. And not sure if he could have gotten that to go overtime in game seven as well, but uh, did go there. So either way, a winning bet there from Tom for Bruins and Maple Leafs as that one did go a full seven games. Tom had the Stars minus one and a half games at plus 158 and Stars got the win. Uh, it took, took a full seven games, though, so no win there on the spread at plus 158. And then the final one is Nathan McKinnon to have the most points in the series between the Az and the Jets at plus 140. Now, McKinnon had nine points in that series. That was tied with Mika Rantanen and Cole McCarr for the most points in the game, so likely a dead heat there. But overall, good read by Tom on the first round of the playoffs. Find Tom on Twitter at Tom underscore Vecchio one. We'll get him back here on the show later on this week to talk more NBA and NHL. Let's go back to USC 301. We had Austin Swaymont, who we had uh, just here today, and recap what he had here in USC 301. In the main event, he had Steve Ersig to win in the money line. That was a plus 154. Did go the entire distance, uh, but Ersig lost by decision. In the co-main event... Austin had uh, Martinez to win by knockout at plus 390. That one was a loss by decision as well. So a lot of fights going the distance there in USC 301. Austin had Gene Silva minus 134 to win uh, over on the money line. And then to win by submission at 7 to 1, lost by submission there for Silva. Austin had Alessandro Costa minus 132 on the money line. And that was a winner. Uh, knockout in the second round to get the win for Costa there. So the Costa money line did hit at minus 132. Austin had Jack Short win by points at plus 390. This one short a pretty gnarly cut on his leg. And it was called by the doctor. So it was gross. So glad they did that. Uh, did not get the bet, but don't want to stare at blood anymore. So uh, an okay loss there. And the final one is Paul Craig to win by knockout or submission at plus 650, but it, Craig was knocked out. So no win there for Craig. Again, find Austin on Twitter at Swain 3 You can check out his USC betting and DFS podcast every Friday over on the FanDuel Research podcast feed. We had Austin Cass on to preview match week 36 in the EPL as the EPL season is winding down now. Find Austin on Twitter at Austin Cass and find his work over at FanDuel Research. Austin had Brighton over one and a half goals at minus 104, taking on Aston Villa. Aston Villa, uh, or the, sorry, Brighton did get the win, but it was only one nil over Aston Villa, so couldn't get over one and a half goals there at minus 104. Austin also had Burnley over one and a half goals at plus 128, taking on Newcastle. Newcastle played lockdown defense for once here, though, and Newcastle won four to one, so a loss there with the Burnley over one and a half goals of plus 128. Final one is Martin Odegaard to score or assist at minus 135 for Arsenal versus Bournemouth. Odegaard was in the starting lineup, and Arsenal did score three times, but not involved in any of those three goals. So couldn't quite get that one there with Odegaard again. Find Austin on Twitter at Austin Cass. As for me, had NASCAR and Formula One on Thursday show. NASCAR in Kansas, I had Ryan Blaney to win 22 to 1, and Blaney was not really that competitive. The entire weekend did restart fifth on the final restart, but got there via two tires and fell back pretty quick as drivers on four tires kind of swallowed him up. Uh, not a good restart by Blaney either. So no win there for Blaney. The other one was Austin Hill plus 850 to finish inside the top 10. Hill was pretty slow and got caught up in a crash. So the crash didn't impact things. He would not have gotten there regardless, but. Uh, missed on both of those. Final one for Formula One was the Carlos Sainz podium plus 175. Sainz didn't get the best start. Got jumped. Uh, he got the, he got a great start actually. He was running second, but then when uh, Checo Perez overshot the first turn, Sainz had to check up uh, and lost some ground there. 
did finish fourth, so one spot out of the podium, but uh, Charles Leclerc beat him for the podium. Lando won, and Max Verstappen too. Uh, so no signs, podium at plus 175. I think that closed around 150 or so, but you know, no cash regardless. So, uh, We'll try to bounce back here next week. Uh, NASCAR heading to Darlington should be a lot of fun for Trucks, Xfinity, and Cup as well. That's all we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Austin Swain for joining us to break down the NBA for tonight and tomorrow. Check out Austin on Twitter at aswain 3 You can find me on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can also find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets. We'll talk to you all once again soon. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 